Okay, everyone. Good evening. Uh, hopefully, then, um, we've all got um, just the opening slide from Success to Failure at Loose. Um, just so if you don't know me, um, I work with uh, Clive Harris at uh, Battle Honours, one of the battlefield tour companies that WFA have used over the years. So I've been to branches and done a few um, talks going back sort of 20 years. So, yeah, historically been a been a battlefield guide. Uh, for quite a while now and um, just sort of relishing the uh, opportunity to talk to you folks um, from my dungeon which is actually uh, a photograph taken in one of the western front tunnels um, I can't remember which one it is off the top of my head but it probably feels like a lot of us do that we're in a bit of a, a dungeon at the moment and so it's quite nice to get together even if it is just virtually and talk about battlefields um, so success to failure at loose um, let's get into this and um, hopefully you'll now start seeing a little bit about the Western Front and uh, of course you, you guys will know that it, it runs from the Belgian coast to the Swiss border and uh, in 1915 the line looked rather like it does um, on your screen now. Uh, interesting to remember though and, and very relevant to why this uh, sort of battle takes place in in the place and and when it does because we are very much the subordinate partner to uh the french um at this at the time of this battle we're we're only controlling sort of 50 or 60 kilometers of that front um and the french have pretty much got the rest obviously the belgians have got their their sector just to the north of belgian north of eeps um but we are very much uh, second fiddle and so it's because of that that we have to play ball along with uh, what the french high command want to do and come uh, september 1915 uh, which is obviously the subject of, of tonight's um uh, talk is uh that the french want to try and push uh, in a third battle of Artois and they want to try and push um, in Champagne and in Artois to try and bite off the Noyon salient and, and I'll show you that to you there that's Noyon down there uh, in the uh, sector down near the Oise near Villas Cotterets and the intention of this um, offensive if you like the third battle of Artois is going to be combining with an, uh, an attack down near Reims uh, involving four French armies. Enormous numbers in the French army here are going to be involved. And the intention here, when uh, when we're going to be fighting at loose, just to give you this sort of bigger picture, when we're going to be fighting at loose, we being the Brits, we're going to be pushing here, uh, where I've just put the second arrow up, pushing uh, in that traditional sort of uh, west to east direction. But the French with their army, with their four armies down the south, are going to be uh, pushing north and the intention was for us to break through and try and bite off that Noyon salient. Now this uh, plan starts to come to uh, you know the planning uh, table in as much as early June and uh, it doesn't fall upon uh, very receptive ears in, in British uh, staff office in that uh, both General Haig and of course his boss Sir John French both say uh, that they're not keen on fighting in this area uh, they're not really ready for this it's, it would have been another uh, major battle in an area that they don't choose to uh, or they don't really want to push in of course they've fought at Neuve Chapelle in March they've had the battle of Obers Ridge and then they've been back fighting at um, Festibair. And to be fair, none of those have been uh, very successful at all. Certainly 1915 really is, is a year of uh, like growing pains for the BEF. Lots has to be learned before the successes which follow later on in 16, 17 and 18. Sort of 1915, not a great year for the British Army and uh, lose the Battle of, um, and I'm not going to correct uh, David on his pronunciation of it. I'm just going to call it loose as well. Someone else uh, better qualified can say it was loss, but we'll just call it loose. Um, yeah, so uh, 1915, we are going to be told uh, we're going to fight there. It's actually Lord Kitchener that puts a little bit more pressure on Sir John French. Uh, by saying that you have to look at the the bigger picture in that the allies on on the on the front with the Russia the Russian front and of course the French and Belgians themselves they need us to be taking part and we do have to do kind of their bidding 
And this is really a sort of, it's an inauspicious start to this Battle of Loos, which is that uh, um, uh, Sir John French and Douglas Haig don't really want to fight there, even though it's described by uh, both of them as, as not the best ground to, to, to fight at. They sort of put in a counter offer in that, why don't we attack near Mezines at the southern end of uh, the Eep salient? Um, that was ground that they would prefer to have been fighting on. But it's it, it's it's poo pooed and uh, they push ahead. And so certainly in July and into August, uh, the go is going to be that we are going to have to fight at Artois. So having sort of zoomed in with this map, a much more modern map, um, you can see there the area of Lons, um, which is um, obviously on that modern map is a lot bigger than it was in the day. Um, but essentially British First Army under command of uh, General Haig is going to be fighting there and north of Lons near bully le mines and up to and including the La Basse Canal, which you can see at the top of the map. The French 10th Army would be fighting again because they've fought down, down that direction before at Suchet and Vimy. And the idea was that we would avoid fighting in the heavily built up city of, uh, of Lons because uh, nobody really wanted to get drawn into that heavy street fighting at this time. And so the intention was that the French would go to the south, uh, the British would move across to the north, and they would meet up on the other side. The intention, though, was what was the objective, really? It was to get to what I've just shown you here. It's the crossings of the Hope Dual Canal at Ponte Vendin. Um, and I've also shown you what that canal looks like. It's one of those very familiar northern France, Belgium uh, canal systems. Um, but if you don't capture those crossings, they're a very formidable obstacle to uh, to get across. So very, uh, uh, how should we say, op optimistic um, objectives to reach from uh, the start lines, which I've shown you with those sort of vertical blue lines near Vermelles and Bully Le Mines, um, give or take a few hundred meters. Um, that's about five miles to capture those crossings. So you could say perhaps um, pie in the sky that someone would break through uh, on the Western Front and get to that. There's even talk in the uh, bigger plan, if you like, is to actually meet up with that uh, French Fourth Army uh, approaching from the south uh, near Valenciennes and Mons. So very, very elaborate, optimistic plans about uh, the Battle of Luz. Always got to talk about the ground, haven't we? Um, and I'm just going to show one slide here. If you haven't been to this battlefield, and I know some of you may not have been, what I wanted to get across to you very quickly was that sort of image. It's flat. It's rather, um, you know, the, the Flanders Plain. It's an ex, it's an extension of that. It's an important area to France, and, and which is why the Germans wanted to capture it so early, it was uh, a clue to which is on the right-hand side of the picture. It's the slag heaps. This is the northern Fr French coal fields. It's a really important area for them to uh, to capture. Um, it supplies a huge amount of coal, or it certainly did up until I think the 1950s, um, and uh, the, the Germans were keen to capture it. But yes, it's very flat, um, slight little um, undulation in the ground, um, but we'll talk about a, a few more features of, of the battlefield in a little while. But yes, agricultural, fairly featureless. And in fact, the only real things that can help you navigate it as a visitor really are the likes of those twin uh, crassiers, which are just uh, just outside the city of uh, Lons and and Luz. So that would help you navigate around. So that's the Battle of Artois. That's why we're fighting there to assist the French with their big attack in the south. Um, and it's going to be uh, set for September. Again, it's one of those uh, battles where the dates creep slightly. And this is the ground. Uh, and s some have said it's unfavourable ground, not a great battlefield to, to, to fight over. And um, very, very similar today. The roads really do match up on trench maps to modern day maps. And the, most of the woods that you see today are now uh, grown back just where they were. Some of the major farms are exactly where they were in 1915. So as far as that goes for a battlefield visitor, it, it's good to get back there and try and see the ground and you can really appreciate um, what it looked like in 1915. 
A few of the features, though, have changed, and I'm going to spend a couple of minutes at trying to explain that. And I won't apologise for mentioning this feature more than once because it, it causes a bit of confusion. Um, those two points, those two sort of mounds that you saw on the last slide, everyone says, oh, is that the double crassier? Well, yes and no. In 1915, it didn't have those big sort of tipped points. It was looking like this, which is a, uh, a flat, um, long line, almost like a big slug lying on the floor. So it was only about half the height that it is today. And, um, and it was lying in a very oblong sort of nature. Um, but that's obviously a, a very contemporary picture of one of the, um, the views uh, just from the British lines. Um, so that was the double crassier, what it looked like in 1915. And to sort of illustrate it, I've used a bit of Google Earth here. So um, the double crassier in 1915, nice in the middle there. That's where it was if you were using uh, a Google map today. So I've illustrated north and running down on the right hand side of our picture um, is, is Lons and is the modern, if I remember rightly, is the A21 road that just um, skirts around to the north of Lons. And our village, the subject of which we're talking mostly about, is Luce, which is at the top of your screen on the left. So the, this is a view that, um, if you like, if you were in a, um, a balloon just above the British lines, looking towards the, the German positions on the double crassier and beyond, this is the sort of position that you might have found yourself looking down. But I've, I'm taking a few minutes just to explain that that double crassier was in a different position to that which um, those, those big mounds are today. So hopefully that helps you sort of orientate onto the battlefield and we'll, we'll, we'll come in and out of that. And the reason we'll come in and out of that, and I'm spending a few minutes on it, it follows the subject of the talk and it's from success to failure. Um, one hour, like many of these um, online talks or, or, you know, I like to think of it as almost like this is part of a, a battlefield tour. We've only got one hour and I, I wouldn't take you on a tour of the battlefield of loose and, and get it all done in an hour. Um, it would take much longer than that. So, I'm doing, if you like, tonight, um, I'm showing you the, the 47th London Division and their attack, and I'll obviously elaborate on that more. Um, and they're in the southern sector, and they do have quite a lot of success on the first day, um, so much so they achieved their objectives. But following on from that are the failures of Luce. Um, so we go from success to failure in this particular sector. So one hour, not enough to cover what goes on in the north and the centre of the battlefield. And hopefully um, that this will give you an idea of this battle and won't want you leave you wanting a little bit more. And I'm sure you'll go off and, and find that about those other parts of the battle. So forerunner to all the battles on the, of the Great War is, uh, is the use of artillery. And um, I will I'll make no apology of using this quote but it's from a very good friend of yours and mine, um, Spencer Jones, who's uh, an absolute master on this subject. So I'm, I'm nicking his uh, description of it because it is so good, and I'm sure he won't mind me saying that. It's the artillery. We've got to start the battle with the artillery because that's what was happening in the First World War. And uh, Spencer very well describes the, the British use of artillery in the Great War in 1915 as the terrible trinity. Um, Basically, we weren't very good in 1915. Um, and there's three things that um, were causing that. Uh, the gunners themselves, and I'll elaborate on each of these shortly. Uh, firstly, the gunners. Yeah, no, uh, no, um, no nastiness intended if we've got any gunners watching. But really, this was a, this 1915 was a, a learning curve, as everyone knows. And uh, this was a, a really sort of painful year for the for a Royal Artillery. Things were accelerating uh, in all parts of the army. But for the, for the Royal Artillery, 1915 was a very painful year. They were being asked to do things that they'd never done before. And um, that's what the terrible trinity will illustrate. So the gunners themselves were historically very subordinate to the infantry because um, they pretty much did what the infantry up until this time in the war told them to do. Um, 
but they weren't necessarily capable of doing it. So rather than presenting, if you like, from the artillery's perspective, this is what we're capable of. Now, what would you like us to do with that in mind? It seemed to be at this stage, the infantry were telling them, you've got to do this. And they ne weren't necessarily capable of doing it. Then the second thing is equipment. Um, and I've illustrated there, the gun on the right is the 60 pounder. Um, I think there was only about six of these per division. Generally, we didn't have enough guns and we didn't have enough ammunition. Um, 18 pounders uh, weren't being delivered at the rate that they were hoped for. We were still using 15 pounders a lot and, and they were pretty inadequate and had been told that in the uh, in wars before with observers. I think it was the Russo-Japanese war. Um, and, and yeah, heavy artillery. Um, your six inch, nine inch and beyond was was rare. We just did not have enough of it. That that total war footing um, was taking an enormous amount of time to get going. And, and understandably, I guess, heavy artillery is not something that you can just turn your small factory in uh, in Wolverhampton or where you're from. If you are making, you know, uh, ratchets for uh, washing mangles it's quite difficult to go from that to making 60 pounder counter counter battery guns it's going to take a little while and uh, the war in september 1915 is only that year old so it takes a while as we see with you know things like vaccines and things they uh, not everything can be done overnight so the equipment in 1915 is is also on a learning curve and it's about delivery and as for artillery rounds um, we're going to see an, if you like, excuse the pun, an explosion of, of, uh, demand. Um, there was, uh, 300, uh, or sorry, 500,000 rounds going to be fired at, uh, the Battle of Luce. Um, but at the Battle of Neuf Chapelle, it's something like 80, 80,000. I'll, I'll have to check my figures, but it, it's, it's grown enormously. Um, and by 1917, uh, at, um, um mezzines they're firing three and a half million rounds so you know you can see that curve going up for from sub one hundred thousand to five hundred thousand in just a year and and then three and a half million just two years later and the requirement for those shells is phenomenal and um some of them aren't good enough and they are um you know a lot of them are not fit for purpose so you combine all those three things and you start to see that the, the war winning equipment of the Royal Artillery was, was not going to be necessarily present at the Battle of Loos. Gas. Um, as most of you have tuned in will know that it was the first use of gas by the Brits, but it was used before us, um, of course, up in the Eep salient. Um, and on the right there is a a German guy fixing up the um, the canisters, the, the cylinders um, for a German use of gas. And in fact, when the British eventually use it at Loose, um, ours, our setup was was very, very similar. Um, the chap on the left is Fritz Haber, a, uh, a German uh, of Jewish descent, funnily enough, um, who is, is put in charge of the gas program for the Germans, um, making use of chlorine gas uh, for the Western Front, um, takes on his duty and, and performs very well for the, the, for the German army in, in rushing forward the research in the, on equipment and effects of gas, and uh, he, he does well for them. Um, of note is the fact that he also gets the Nobel Prize for uh, chemistry. Uh, not for his work to do with gas, but actually to do with um, agricultural use of um, fertilizer. And it's thought that there are more people alive uh, and doing well out of agriculture subsequently uh, because of his work in agriculture uh, and, and herbicide, pesticides and, and fertilizer, sorry, uh, rather than, um, you know, his, his work in the opposite field, if you like, of killing people with gas. So, yeah, um, goes on to do good things and, and gets the Nobel Prize. Um, I believe his wife commits suicide um, during the war when she finds out of his work involving chlorine gas. So a, a, a man of troubled background. So that's Fritz Haber. Um, the Germans used the gas in the cylinders and um, they release it in a gas cloud. 
and by uh, that's in April 1915 and within 10 days Lord Kitchener uh, 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 orders that uh, the British Army should prepare a suitable weapon uh, to reply and uh, you know it, the wheels are put in motion very quickly. Uh, so much so that um, they, they form the Royal Engineers Special Companies and for this they need to find men that are chemists and that uh, might have an understanding of basic chemistry or engineering. They, they speak to 50 universities um, across the country, across the Commonwealth, and they, they comb those universities for people that have got any background in, in chemistry that might be willing to come and work in either research, development or delivery. And they also then obviously comb the British Army, um, several million men by then, and um, they find another few hundred guys that have got something connecting them to the, the production, the use of the cylinders, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fawkes and uh, his, his guy, he's put in charge of it. He's got a background in, in, uh, in chemistry as well. He's put in charge of these companies. Uh, they made every man a corporal. Um, because they thought that it would be um, more useful as the men were going up the line or getting involved in deployment of the cylinders that's rather like uh, military police and things that if they were a corporal armed with a revolver um, other people would take more notice of them than uh, if they were just privates, private soldiers. But of course they didn't know who they were and that was that was another key part to this was uh, total secrecy or OPSEC operational security so each man was uh, was told not to talk about it and uh, uh, utmost secrecy was required and uh, they had to talk about it as the as the accessory or the, the secret um, rats they called it yeah rats um, so they, they brought in various secret words um, and they weren't allowed to use the words chlorine or gas uh, in its deployment uh, the cylinders there that, that's an unusual photograph not not seen uh, before um, by myself anyway, certainly not widely found on any internet use. And it's um, British, it's the cylinders set up in the same way. Uh, the cylinders weigh about 160 pounds, uh, about sort of four foot long. Um, and when the gas has been discharged from them, they still weigh about 100 pounds. So uh, they brought those cylinders, cylinders up in the two days before, um, again, hundreds of men involved in bringing these up in, in total secrecy. They had to bring them up in lorries and then manhandle them, usually uh, one between two men carried on a, a long pole over their back. And they would uh, then bring them up to the trench bays and position them. They wanted 6,000 cylinders. Um, each one can discharge its gas in just over two minutes. Um, and they wanted 6,000, but they were short. I think it was just over 5,000 cylinders in the end. And um, that's about 150 tonnes of uh, chlorine gas. Um, one of the problems they found was that when they, how to release the gas um, was done on a, uh, an exit valve through to a pole, which was then positioned over the front of the parapet as you can imagine, and the wind had to carry it towards the enemy. Um, there was a problem with this and it was inflexible and it, it didn't allow some flexibility with the positioning of the cylinder and sandbags and so forth. And a young officer known as Livens, called Livens, came forward with the idea of a manifold with four uh, valves, four exits on the manifold that led to rubber hoses. And this was found to be much more uh, useful and of course Livens himself goes on to uh, invent the Livens projector which you may have heard um, for, for firing off uh, gas canisters and um, phosphorus and smoke um, bombs etc. So yeah um, the other the other chap that was uh, employed was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gold. Now Gold was a meteorologist um, the, the RAF had meteorologists everywhere um, and they offered one of those for the army but um, Lieutenant Colonel Fulks and, in, and indeed General Haig said that they wanted their own one um, and so they went off and found Lieutenant Colonel Gold and he was an expert in uh, wind and uh, so he became known of course the WAGs in the British Army as the Chief Flatulence Officer and he would study 
the uh, wind patterns. And this was done by deployment of devices just four foot above the ground, which of course was no interest to the RAF. Um, and so that's why they, they positioned their wind uh, meters all over the battlefields nearby to try and monitor it. And they, they, they've said it was the most monitored section of weather up to uh, that point in, in man's history. Um, they were watching it intently for those four days because every bit of wind, uh, every mile an hour of wind made made a big difference to how this battle was going to go. And of course, um, it's at 3.30 in the morning that on the 25th of September that the wind is blowing in the right direction, which is obviously towards the German lines, but at just about four miles an hour, any more than that, and it would have been too much and it would dissipate any less than that it would stay still and worse still changing conditions would bring it back um, uh, towards our own lines so moving down into our battlefield a little bit closer um, same slide as before but i've now illustrated the divisional lineup uh, in first core area one corps, the second the ninth and the seventh division and including the battle, uh, including the La Basse Canal in the north, the second division straddled the north and south banks of the canal. And then in the south, where we're going to be looking, was the first division in the middle, the 15th straddling the uh, Bethune to Loose Road, and then right down the south, um, almost shaking hands with the French on the right, was the 47th London Division. The two other things I've highlighted for you there is the double crassier with that grey cigar-like shape, just to show you that's where we're looking at. And the red uh, circle shows you where I may refer to later on, just to give you an idea where it was, is Hill 70. Um, not a very impressive hill, as you can imagine, those of you that go to Eeps and go to Hill 60, and it's kind of like, well, where is it? Oh, yeah, we're standing on it. It's not very impressive and Hill 70 is very easy to miss. Um, it's mainly dominated by that road junction and, and a modern day aerodrome, which sits on the eastern side of that north-south road there. That's the, um, uh, the loose aerodrome. So this is the area we're going to look at between uh, Bully and Loose, just there. And that shows you where the 47th Division are going to attack. General Barter fought in Ashanti in charge of the 47th London Division. Um, himself, um, he's a great planner and uh, he could foresee, uh, having learned this already in, in, the, in the year of the war so far and in his previous service, um, noting that difficulties of battle are many times uh, to do with orientation and to do with people getting lost in amongst the fury and mess of battle um, and, and not knowing exactly where they need to be or where their objective is. So he took each of his battalion and brigade leaders and, and right down to company commanders and indeed platoon commanders were taken out of the line and taken to an area just about three miles behind the lines where they laid out a, a mock um, sand table of, of the event and talked to everyone through um, what was going to be required of them, um, showed them maps, etc., on a sand table. And at the same time, they then found a, a piece of area that resembled the ground, and everyone was taken to that. And they lined up with uh, red flags showing where objectives were, blue, blue flags were rally points and stores positions, and white lines were, white tapes were laid out to show where their um, communication trenches were that they could use, et cetera, et cetera. And this was also that all of the troops from literally private upwards could um, orientate on the battlefield if, if, uh, if their um, soldiers above them, their NCOs and officers were knocked out. So really did his stuff in uh, staff work and planning, got his boys on the spot. And they are going to be attacking from that position known as the Sniper's House, if you can see it at the bottom, across the double crassier and round that and in towards Loose. And we'll talk a bit more about that now. So here's another of those sort of oblique looks at the battlefield. So this is looking again as if you're in a uh, barrage balloon or sorry, an observation kite balloon just behind the British lines looking towards the German positions. And you could see that double crassier in the foreground, which of course, as I said before, cuts across 
what is the uh, the modern day slag heaps and loose is across the uh, the ground ahead of us um and so the the battalion uh, was lined up the brigades were lined up uh, the 7th battalion london regiment 6th battalion the cast iron 6th and the 18th battalion the london irish and the 7th battalion at the bottom there that's of course the shiny 7th because uh, pre war they had uh, brass shiny buttons as opposed to just about everyone else who had uh, black buttons. So it's great how these old names stick. Uh, but these are London Regiment chaps from the 47th London Division. So um, they're, uh, they've been in action already before this, and um, they are here to take the double crassier and to push across. Um, and they have the Scottish 15th Division on their left-hand side. In fact, if you can see just to the left-hand side of uh, where the 18th Battalion are, you can see in what is in no man's land there, a square in that uh, field. And that of course is um, one of the cemeteries, uh, the main cemetery for the loose battlefield. So if you go over there you, are, you, you and visit that, you're stood in, in no man's land. So that's how the battalions were gonna line up and uh, they are gonna go over the top at uh, five fifty uh, was the release of the gas, and at six thirty was the uh, was the advance by the by the infantry. Um, I did mention the gas release. The gas release was going to be uh, over a forty minute period. Uh, why was it over forty minutes? Um, it was because they knew that uh, German gas masks, which were a little bit ahead of ours at that point, because they they'd started the use of gas earlier than us um, in nineteen fifteen. Um, was we knew then that the chances are their gas masks would only last 20 minutes before being saturated and then they would have to change gas masks and it was widely uh, known that the Germans generally carried a spare gas mask so if we could therefore saturate the German lines for 40 minutes is his a second gas mask would also have been um, been used but we were short of gas, even though we had 5,000 cylinders, 150 tonnes. They knew that wasn't going to be enough because of the frontage that we were attacking over. So um, they interspersed the release of gas with the use of smoke um, from a number of different methods. And it's that smoke and gas that combined over 40 minutes um, to, to make this huge, great, what's described as white, grey, and green and even yellow uh, cloud of chlorine gas. And if you want to know what that would have smelt like, just think of the last time you went to a swimming pool, which for most of us was at least more than a year ago. However, if you can remember that swimming pool smell, um, yeah, chlorine gas. So that's set off um, for the first 12 minutes, I think it was, of gas. And then they had eight minutes of smoke and then another 10 minutes of gas another few minutes of smoke and then gas, you know, so they had to uh, turn one off um, for a little while because they didn't have enough, but there was hope that it would intermingle. And we were then of course, waiting for that uh, wind to just carry it across, across nicely um, to the, um, to the enemy lines. Um, artillery bombardment. Um, I, I should have said that last point about the methods. I missed that off on the Trinity, the terrible Trinity. I'll just jump back to that, was the method of this, um, was that, that, that because of number one and two, i.e. equipment and men, we weren't necessarily able to use uh, artillery bombardments uh, as much as we would have done later in the war. That The idea of calling down artillery accurately uh, on demand was was non-existent at this stage of war there was no method no means um you know it was it was in its infancy and was in a, in a large battle it just wasn't possible uh, they were firing on fixed lines to advance um it, in in the early days of a creeping barrage i guess but largely it was lifting um at so many minutes um, they'd also tried hurricane bombardments like they did at uh, Obers Ridge and Neuve Chapelle, and these were limited in effect. Um, you need an enormous amount of dense weight of fire to, to, to really be effective um, to, to, to do those hurricane bombardments. So th that was the last um, part of the artillery attack I must, must uh, have missed out. So yes, gas released at uh, 550. 
and at 6 30 the boys go over the top i just love that uh old um i think it's probably london evening standard or one of those daily sketches um it shows um what another aspect of 1915 in that there's a i think in that one photograph um, certainly on the sort of the original, the slightly zoomed out version, there's about five different types of hand grenade on show. Uh, and that was the case. You know, you've got the Hales grenades and um, you've got the great grenades with streamers on. You've got the ones described as cricket balls um, and you've got the ones that are described as um, hairbrush grenades and jam tin bombs, um, most of which they found at loose, which because it was raining isn't most battlefields. Um, uh, they couldn't they couldn't make the grenades work very easily because the grenades needed to be lit with uh, almost like a brassard and a, and a match in a very sort of Napoleonic style, um, um, you know, with a, a brassard and a match and an igniter and a fuse, so it's almost comical style. So yeah, that just sort of illustrates the um, the, the the grenades were uh, in there. Um, learning curve if you like as well this is pre mills bomb and obviously it's also pre brody hat as well they're using their they're wearing their field service caps i think they were called anyway the flat flat caps of the, the british army at that point the 18th battalion then um known as the london irish um famously kick a football across when they kick off um this photograph, courtesy, uh, I must mention, of my good friend, uh, Mike Scheel, who ran his uh, projects during the centenary years of Fields of Battle, Lands of Peace. And I asked him if I could use this, and he's a good buddy. So uh, this is allegedly one of the footballs used in this attack, where members of um, one of the companies of the 18th Battalion, London Irish, decide in their infinite wisdom that it will distract the lads to kick the football across in front of them as they rise from the trenches um, and their breastworks and head off towards the German lines. And in, in fact, the, the direction of this photograph isn't quite true. That's almost looking due south from their positions, but it's a great evocative photograph with the mist settling around the, the crassier. They would actually have been going slightly across to your left-hand side. But yes, the, uh, the, the, the ball is kicked across and um, there is a lovely account. Um, I'm not going to read it tonight. I haven't got time, but if you look at the 18th Battalion history, of this ball being kicked and um, sure enough it, it turns up just as a lot of the Irish London Irish do amongst the German lines and it's found in a sort of rather sorry looking state deflated and I, I can picture that now having looked at the uh, the ball we've got in the photograph almost looking like that and it was wedged up against a bit of German barbed wire but it was there and it had reached the front line so yes the 18th battalion uh, reached the German lines and get through and the other two battalions I talked about the sixth and the seventh. They also break through into the German line. Their, their jobs, those three battalions, was to breach the first line. Uh, the seventh battalion, they attack the double crassier itself. And uh, rather than sort of go around it both sides, they're more to the north of the double crassier and they climb up the, the lip. Uh, German trenches weren't all over the crassier because it was made of a, uh, it was a slaggy. So it was all, all the all the bits and pieces from the coal mine. So very difficult to really build anything substantial in, but the Germans had, had sort of hollowed out some observation posts and some, some fire positions, if you like, on top of and just below the lip hidden sort of on the leading edge for German field observation officers. Um, but nevertheless, by, by seven o'clock, the 7th Battalion have captured the Crassier and um, declare it captured and they lose more men when the Germans counterattack. About nine o'clock in the morning, they launch a counterattack coming round clockwise from the bottom rather than them going fighting over the top. They had a trench which connected with the Crassier and they used that to get up to it and then and then storm across the top. And it's in that uh, fight that the um, 7th Battalion suffer more casualties in the counterattack. Um, but they hold on and they also capture some of the Germans, um, about 250 and several machines machine guns from the um, from the uh, double crassier. Further the north was the cast iron sixth and they attacked uh, between the 18th London Irish and uh, one 
uh, rifleman there, rifleman Challoner, was seen to have uh, lost his uh, company sergeant major and his uh, platoon commander, and he jumps into a German communication trench, chasing the Germans at the point of the bayonet and kills nine of them within the space of 30 or 40 yards um, and, and brings back half a dozen captured and a uh, German machine gun. I think it's um, some company, a company sergeant major Yelf t- takes over after the uh, loss of his officers in his company, and he gets the um, DCM for um, leading the guys through um, up to the objectives with the sixth battalion. But the summary of which is that both, uh, sorry, all three of those battalions have reached their objectives. That was the first wave. The second wave was the uh, 19th Battalion and the 20th Battalion of the London Regiment. The 20th is the Woolwich and Blackheath. And I think the 19th, hold on, uh, Finsbury Rifles, is it? St Pancras Rifles, I think. So their objectives lined up in a line there for those three battalions is the cemetery, a location known as Garden City, and what was known as the Quarry. And I've also shown you there, and there was a second crassier, the loose crassier, not to be con- confused with the double crassier, which is still on the map right in the bottom left-hand corner. The loose crassier in front of which was that huge winding gear, um, tower-like structure, which was known to everyone as um, Tower Bridge. So that was a real feature of the battlefield. The Garden City is actually still there today. As you can see in that uh, map, it looks almost like a football field. Uh, it it was recently designed and built in loose with with uh, miners' houses in a square shape, and I suppose it was a sort of a French effort at um, Ebenezer Howard's garden cities uh, that we see over here. So, so so it was marked on a map as Garden City, but I I don't think actually the Garden Cities had. Um, really come around until after that point so whether that was the how it got its name or not it there's confusion I think in a, in a later book someone said they called it Welling Garden City but it, Welling Garden hadn't been found at that point um, but anyway it's still there today so it's useful to to identify the location of Garden City and the cemetery of course is still there today and it's actually about twice the size of it but the objective for the 19th Battalion was to take the cemetery and then to get to the tower winding gear of Luce Crassier and take that and then push patrols out beyond it to the to the right-hand side of your map to where Hill 70 is, which is just on the right-hand side there. 20th Londons were to take Garden City and the quarries just to the uh, the, the west side, uh, southwest side of the Crassier, and also to push forward across where you can see that modern motorway. The 19th Londons reach the cemetery and they're described as fierce fighting, uh, uncovering what they say is ghoulish remains in and around the cemetery as, as their, um, their crypt-like burial chambers are exposed and head rest, headstones are knocked over, but they capture it. The Germans had dug a trench line straight through the, uh, the cemetery. There's fierce fighting through there, but push them back, they do. And the 19th London push through and they get to the other side talk about them more in a moment um the co uh collison morley lieutenant collison morley um captures or he, the group he's with capture the tower bridge but a short time later he's killed very close to the uh the tower there 20th london's the woolwich and blackheath push through the 7th battalion and they take over they take the garden city they move forwards to the quarry they have to skirt round it and they don't actually capture it for the best part of 48 hours, but they isolate the Germans that are there um, who are described as somewhat more of a nuisance than anything, but they don't surrender. But there's obviously a couple of quarries because they say they don't hold, they hold out for nearly 48 hours, but in one of the quarries, the, uh, the 20th London's capture two uh, field guns, two German 77 millimeter field guns. And these are very proudly uh, taken back by the 20th Battalion. And uh, a short time later, they find their way all the way to London and they're uh, displayed on Horse Guards Parade. And there's actually a few pictures of it, um, of, this, of these field guns um, uh, being being paraded around around um, central London. So so proud were the 20th Londons that they'd, they'd got these guns and taken them back. 
They do get to the other side and send out patrols, having isolated the quarries and uh, pushed towards Hill 70. And of course, not talking about them entirely tonight, but we must mention and fighting so bravely from the north bank of uh, Luce is the 15th Scottish Division who, who um, capture the front line, push through, and then elements of the 10th Gordons and the 8th and 9th Black Watch also find themselves pushing through the town and indeed out the other side. So there's the two two divisions fighting it in what must be described as a fairly um, um, confusing urban environment. I've um, got two pictures here. Let's talk, talk about the one on the left. This is just uh, to give you an idea of what Luce looked like. This is um, Luce just after the battle, taken in one of those postcards. And then you've got the uh, tower bridge remnants of the mangled metal winding gear at the back there but i love the description um which which is relevant to this and it, and it's where if you can imagine the men of the 19th london's are breaking into loose and on their left hand side the men of the 15th scottish division are also breaking into loose and uh, they describe their coming together and both know that each other's going to be appearing at some point. But the way they describe it is such that uh, they dis they say, if you've ever been to a football match just before three o'clock kickoff on a Saturday with men emerging from railway stations, from bus stations and car parks, side streets and alleyways and pubs coming out from all over, but they're all going with one purpose and they're all moving down the street towards the football stadium. I promised David I'd get another football mention in, which is why I'm using this uh, quote here. Um, and uh, sure enough, this this is this is how they describe it: that the, the the jocks, if you like, are coming out of the buildings on the left through doorways and alleyways, having cleared Germans out with with grenades down to dugouts, and the the Londoners are coming out, and and this sort of uh, somewhat odd feeling of all coming out, and knowing where the joint objective is. It's the tower bridge ahead, almost like, you know, towering above you, the uh, the football stadium of your chosen team or rugby, if you prefer. But yeah, it's um, an odd way that they describe it. But, you know, if you've if you've been around on one of those Saturdays, you'll understand it. Uh, the photo on the right, uh, another person to thank is my good mate, Steve Hammond. And uh, this photograph hasn't been seen before and was taken by men of the 19th Battalion London Regiment. We don't know which one, but it's uh, it's written on the back. It's an original photograph of Tower Bridge and the, the loose crassier, not the double one. Uh, and it says um, 19th Battalion um, photograph taken of newly captured trenches 25th of September 1915 so these are jerry trenches looking back in in ground that they just captured just south of um, the town incredible photograph but it does give you an idea of how uh, smashed up it was and, and and the chalky nature of the ground yeah we've mentioned them once but we must mention of course what's happening to the fur further to the north um whilst the the, the men of the London Regiment have captured their um, objectives on, on the far side of, of Luce. 15th Scottish Division have been in action. They captured Lons Road Redoubt, which is just where uh, that cemetery was I was talking about, which is in no man's land. And they pushed across the battlefield and had met up with some of the uh, London boys in, in, the, in the village. However, and this becomes a feature as you go further north, the wind did not work in their favour. Due to gravity taking an effect on this gas, because um, the chlorine gas is actually heavier than air, and so gravity overall pulls it to a low point. And so it sinks into trenches, it falls onto rivers, and it hugs the uh, canal to the north. Um, it didn't take much wind uh, to push it in the wrong direction either. And the further north you go up the battlefield, the less effective the gas was because the wind and the gravity didn't work in its favour. You'll see from some of those other photographs, or if you visit the battlefield, Luce sits in a, like a hollow in a in a in a uh, saucer. The village itself is in the base of that saucer, and so the gas was pulled into the village, and it and it hung around in there. Further north, on the exposed flat 
billiard-like uh, openness, um, as seen in that first photograph. The, the, the gas blew initially into the German trenches, then hung around, and then it started to drift backwards. And so less successful um, uh, attacks are seen as you go further north. So Scots valiantly push on, but they're turned back by the, uh, the Germans further north and they suffer horrendous amounts of casualties. Bo both the Scottish divisions suffer uh, more people, uh, some suffer more casualties than, than the other divisions. Um, one chap there, Piper Laidlaw, gets the Victoria Cross for um, marching up and down in front of the boys, playing various um, rousing tunes for several hours, encouraging the men to go forward. That brave stuff that they do with bagpipes. Further north still, um, but it's another worthy mention, is, is the uh, part of the battlefield with the first division right in the middle of the battlefield. And if you can see on the official history map there, there's a point called Lone Tree. I'll just use my cursor if you can see that down here. And these troops lined up here are a mixture of first lanks, so regular troops, second KRRs, but alongside them look the 10th Gloucesters, 8th Royal Berkshires. Um, these are new army troops mixed in with regulars. And of course, it's a story that many of you will have come across before that perhaps sometimes you want the regulars, the old contemptibles, the old boys, because they really know what they're doing. They're tried and tested. They, you know, they know how to exploit a position. Uh, they know how to dig in. They know how to use weapons, etc. But they've also become somewhat um, uh, jaded and cynical and why me, etc. And you put them next to the 10th Gloucesters, who may not know exactly what they're doing, but they've got that sort of boyish, youthful exuberance and energy. And actually, you, you combine those two sets of things, and that's that's what makes a good team. Um, so th that, that was one of the things going on here, was to move in units like the Gloucesters next to the the, the, the regulars of the, the Lanks. And um, their, their, their objectives was to get across no man's land, uh, capture a woodland called Bois Carre, while the loyal North Lanks took the Lone Tree. And here we have on the picture, the Lone Tree. It's not the original. Um, but it's um, it's been planted and, and is there to symbolise the original lone tree. Um, and uh, many people visit it and lay wreaths, etc. There is a small little marker at the base of the tree there. But again, with that photograph, you can see how open and exposed it is. So enormous casualties and no successes. It's there's this a real, real tough, tough story to tell. Um, um, in the first divisional area, no, no success at all, turned back with, with enormous casualties. A chance for a few minutes just to talk about the reserves then. So in the south, the 47th London Division achieved all its objectives. The 15th Scottish Division, some of its objectives, um, with more success on their right flank with, with the Londoners, uh, but less towards the north and then the first division and units further north have got little success so who are the reserves and when are they going to be used well the man in the middle with the pencil drawing is Richard Haking in charge of the 11th corps uh, he's only in his mid 50s if I recall uh, although of course with these pictures you always tend to think that they must have been that much older but born in about 1860 something uh, if I recall yeah so mid mid 50s um, and he'd, um, he knew, he knew, um, Douglas Haig, he'd been to staff college with him and he'd also been, um, overseas with him, possibly in Africa. I, I don't recall, but they certainly knew each other. And when they came back to all the shot, they'd worked very closely together. So, uh, I think you could describe them, um, as buddies. Um, Haking was in charge, uh, very recently put in charge of the newly formed on paper 11th Corps which was two new divisions and one old. So it was the 21st division, the 24th division, and the guards division recently formed up. Again, it's a mixture of old and new. So he was given command of those. 
and uh, Luce was going to be the, the opportunity for him to get into battle. A first army commander, Douglas Haig, uh, but commander in chief, uh, Sir John French. This can only be described um, as a complete model as to who really controls the reserves at Luce. And um, I've, I've looked at a few sources and a few books um, and searched, and, and it, all of it's a muddle, and it was still muddy right up until uh, the day of the battle. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, Sir John French wanted to keep control of 11 Corps and controlled, uh, wanted to keep control of the reserves. His reasoning for that essentially was that he would then decide where was the main effort, uh, where was the weakness to be exploited, and, and he wanted to be able to make that decision and to release it at the right time, be it north, be it south or central. Uh, General Haig wanted to be in command of the reserves because he said time will be of the essence, and if he controlled it, he could also say whether he needed it front, um, sorry, to the north, centre or middle. And of course, Haking was told what to do by either of them, um, but found that the, the instructions were, were muddy, to say the least. But he clearly had allegiances uh, aligned with uh, Haig and wasn't going to do too much um, in the event of anything going wrong that would harm their relationship. Um, the French, not Sir John, but the actual French uh, Joff said um, that he also believed that the, the control of the resources was critical and should be as close to the front line and the operational commander in Hague um, than should be with uh, Sir John French. And um, he's, he, he, they, they ignore him as well, though. Um, they compromise in that they bring uh, the 11 Corps up to four miles from the front line on the 24th of September. And the latest uh, instruction was that command would pass from uh, Sir John French to Hague um, when uh, 11 Corps reaches the jump off trenches that have been vacated by the attacking divisions in front of them. Um, so work that one out if you can as to a smooth handover. And that's before the battle started. And so with the, you know, the, the vagaries of warfare, um, communications being lost, etc. It's going to be a, it's going to be difficult to know exactly who was in control and when uh, they would be released. But the uh, the key point was that the time was going to have passed. You see here the German view. So to orientate you now, you're you're looking as if you are a German gunner machine gunner or otherwise, although I appreciate you're slightly higher off the ground than they would have been for the view, but it was so that you could get a, a, a feel for the ground. Straight away, you can orientate, you're looking south. The British essentially are attacking across from right to left. And uh, over to the top of the screen, you've got Hill 70 there. Like I said, there's not much to it, but it's a slight rise in the ground. You can probably tell by where that road is out on the left-hand side, how that's in a low hollow in the bottom, and then it rises up to go to Hill 70. And on the right at the top, you've got the double crassier as is, and uh, you can ignore the, the modern winding gear. That, that, that doesn't bear resemblance to any part of the 1915 battlefield. And sitting in the bowl of the valley at the bottom there, you can just see the sort of reflections on some of the houses underneath where that winding gear tower is. And that's the battle of, uh, that's the, the village of Luce. So 11 Corps um, should have um, been able to get to the battlefield very quickly on the 25th of September. Um, and they should have been able to get there before the time they do. It's four miles away, but they actually don't get there. Um, it takes them over um, six hours to travel um, the four miles. And uh, we'll come back to that reason a little bit later on. But the, um, when they do arrive, it's late in the afternoon. So bear in mind that zero was uh, 5.50 for the gas and the boys jumped off at 6.30. Um, it's it's uh, three or four o'clock before um, the Corps arrive on the battlefield to take over and to, to, to push on for the attack. But it's so late in the day 
that it's decided that um, they will actually have to attack the next day on the 26th of September. When they do, um, in the morning, the, um, the, the units that are already out on the battlefield, the 15th Scottish, the Londoners, and one or two detached elements of the 21st Division, they make a further attempt to capture Hill 70 from the, from the first day fighting out on your left here, um, but that fails. And it's um, late on the um, late in the morning of the 26th of September that 11 Corps en masse are, are brought up. Now, as I've said, uh, they they've they've had to move up four miles the day before, but it's fair to say in the previous few days before this, they've been on the move for over 25 miles. Um, they've not had a proper night's sleep. They've been sleeping under the stars, as it were, in the rain at the roadside. Very few of them made uh, got got into any proper billets, and in particular, the 24th Division uh, hadn't had hot food for over 24 hours because someone in staff command um, staff office uh, made a decision to remove the uh, company cookers from the uh, from the route of march. So all they had was the the food that they were carrying. So supplies were rather short, and um, you know they'd covered 30 miles. In, in in pretty atrocious conditions and let's not forget they'd never fired a shot in anger these first two divisions the 21st and the 24th are completely untested and most of them have only been in France for two weeks on the move from uh, Calais and from Boulogne so this is going to be their first uh, arrival on the battlefield now I'm sure you can uh, even if you haven't got any military experience you can probably appreciate the um the complexities of arriving on a battlefield that you've not seen before it's dark it's raining and you're being told to push forward the enemy's out there but not to worry because the day before the guys have broken through you are told that you're going forward to consolidate a position uh, towards hill 70 and to exploit any weakness that's about as vague as this information was um, most of their officers hadn't, hadn't been in battle before, of course, either, and they are literally getting up out of the trenches, moving forward over ground that they're unfamiliar with. Not a great start. This is the track um, showing uh, how the um, Corps come in across the, uh, the fields the 21st and the 24th divisions advancing across, then they're slightly oblique to their right towards Hill 70 to exploit that ground. Slight rise in the ground there as they go forward. But straight away, as they approach Hill 70, they come under fire both from artillery and heavy machine gun fire from Hill 70 and from the position that we're looking at as well. Uh, so they are being enfiladed from both sides and uh, with machine gun fire and they're being hit with artillery. They do get to the road that crosses uh, up towards Hill 70, some of them. Uh, this is the 24th Division mainly, um, but they get to that field that's just across the other side of the road. They're very spread out. The casualties are rising. The officers and NCO numbers are, are dwindling and essentially by about three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, a, a retirement is is um, is in effect. It hadn't been ordered necessarily, but it certainly was uh, in effect as men who were able to call back, pull back. It becomes later known as the field of corpses, and that's that low-lying ground that straddles both sides of the road. So again, if you visit that part of the battlefield, you'll be able to see where 11 Corps came to an end essentially the huge amount of casualties caused across those fields um, in very inauspicious conditions um, and one such chap that uh, gets the Victoria Cross there is, is Sergeant Saunders of the Suffolk Regiment 26th of September um, he comes forward with a uh, Lewis gun section and um, the uh, 
all around him. He, he can see people falling. He, he stops with the Lewis gun section to command them and to give them direction as to their fire. Some, some, some Germans are counter-attacking and a nearby officer um, recounts the story of how he sees this chap that he later finds out is Sergeant Saunders um, directing fire. And then a shell lands literally a few yards between them. Um, uh, Sergeant Saunders shouts and um, the officer looks over and sees that the best part of the lower part of his right leg and from the knee down is gone. And uh, he quickly uh, throws a um, tourniquet on and, and bandages himself up. And to his amazement, the officer says that Saunders then just reloads the Lewis gun and starts firing at the enemy and taking them out. Um, he, is, uh, he puts him forward for and, and Saunders gets the Victoria Cross and that's not his headstone that's um is um one of those memorial stones um that they put up in the or they put down in this in the in the footway um uh in the centenary for vc winners so yeah great great action there uh by a very brave uh courageous chap arthur saunders vc 26 of september casualties then um we're not going to talk too much more because it will come out in a few seconds, but the, the battle peters out with the attack by the guards division the next day um, on the 27th of September. And that too um, doesn't get any higher up the ground. If you, if you understand uh, to Hill 70, some of them kind of get up to the top there, but not many. And the, and the guards division attack also fails. So success 47th London division, to the failure of the guards exploiting that success um, following uh, 11th Corps. Um, casualties of the battle, um, just going to remind myself of the numbers, 50,000 casualties, uh, 16,000 killed in action. Uh, that's three times more than the Germans. Um, there was 8,000 casualties in the first 10 battalions. Um, and there were 10 battalions um, that had over 600 men ca in casualties, and a lot of those were the Scottish as well. A French loss, though, 50,000 in the 10th Army, um, so far more um, down in the south as well, 240,000 casualties in, in Champagne, um, which obviously is five times more. 1915 is the very worst year of the war for the French. Um, I saw some stats recently. Um, they lost, uh, I think it was 3 million casualties in 1915, um, obviously, re, you know, on a regurgitating uh, wound cycle. But um, the casualty ratio from German inflicted casualties and French suffered casualties was two to one against in 1915, the worst of the war. Um, that, that drops away considerably down to the sort of one to one and better in 1918. But yeah, horrendous losses for the French in 1915. Um, some other casualties. Um, so we can personalize this a little bit more. There's a little story here from a battlefield tour, which I was very pleased to be invited to give um in i think it was 2015 for the centenary year might have been 16 uh was this cross uh it's known as the loose cross and on it are the names of about 20 uh london lads mainly from the 17th and uh 19th battalions yeah 17th battalion uh london regiment um from uh in and around poplar stepney and bow now this cross today is original burial marker. You can see it on the left there, but the original that's the original, and it was was stood, um, uh, sorry, based in Bow Church or near the Bow flyover in London, um, in in the church there, and we were asked to do a battlefield tour and take the cross back. And I said, well, what's the story with the cross? And it was most interesting. And we were able to do a bit of research for them. So there's a number of chaps on it. And we started looking up where they all are. And, and most of them are no known grave. Um, and the story was that it had stood on the battlefield. And when their original burial positions were, were put 
in the ground. This was with the original. And then they were reinterred and moved. And through the war diaries and some other accounts, um, you'll see on the right hand side that trench map. If you look carefully, slightly towards the top of the the annotated um, trench map below the, the modern day map is a point known as Tosh Fort and Fort Tosh, Tosh Trench. Well, these, um, Tosh Alley, that's right, They uh, these guys in the war diary on the 17th Battalion, this is a few days after the battle, were billeted there, uh, were holding that position in Tosh uh, Trench, and that's where their battalion HQ was. And it describes how over a number of, number of days they suffer casualties by German counter-attacking um, artillery fire. And all of those men were taken out into the rear of Tosh, um, Fort Tosh and Tosh Alley and buried together in a, a number of graves. And this marker was put up. Now the graves registration forms for these guys on the War Graves website say they were all taken from these grid coordinates and from a, a grave called uh, uh, Tosh Alley. And they were reburied in Dud Corner um, the main cemetery at Luz, and um, they were put into this grave reference here. Um, but it isn't just one grave, the reference was for the line. So, somewhere between Tosh Alley and Dud Corner, uh, these guys have become unknowns. And I guess it's because they were actually unknowns when they were buried. Um, no one was actually individually marking the graves, they put that one marker up for all of them. But nevertheless, we approached the War Graves Commission and wondered whether they might um, put believed to be or known to be buried near this spot. But um, they weren't weren't happy that there was enough evidence for that. But we thought it was a great thing. Uh, we actually visited that site uh, where Tosh Trench was. We went to it to see what the modern day building was. And it's actually a French gite. So um, we knocked on the door. And with our uh, aid of our interpreter, a great friend of mine from the Wargraves Commission, Nigel Stevens, um, some of you know him, we, he talked a good bit of French. They, uh, they didn't know anything about it, but they were very keen on the war and, and, and uh, pro-British uh, um, around there. And it turned out their son, who was in the background, he was home on leave from the French Marines and had a broken arm so he was on leave and we went up to the cemetery the next day with the with the school party and the group from the church and uh, the marine and the family of, of from the jeep came up and were present at the ceremony we had there so it's a nice way of um, remembering those chaps from london now a question always comes up what about kipling well the reason i didn't mention uh my boy Jack or John Kipling um, was because he's not in the um, part of the tour that we were doing today. But yes, uh, Rudyard Kipling uh, helps his son, um, John Kipling, um, only 18, get into the army after he failed the entrance eyesight test. Um, but he pulls a few strings and gets him into the army. Um, and unfortunately, Kipling's killed in that guards attack, which I just started to mention on the 27th of September. And uh, his body's not found and uh, Kipling re revisits the ground uh, many times, writes the book, My Boy Jack. And there he is on the left hand side. That's actually at um, Dud Corner uh, Memorial, where his name is inscribed um, a little bit more detail for you, for those that are interested in more in, in, in his story. Um, what we've done here is that's the original trench map. We've overlaid it on the modern map. And then what I've done is I've used those blue lines. So you can see that's the path given in the war diaries and the various accounts that the Irish Guards Battalion that he's a member of take and they come in across the battlefields. They go through Chalk Pit Wood at the top and their uh, objective is to get up to Hill 70, which indeed on the 25th of September and the early part of the 26th of September, troops do get up there. But um, and when they do get up there, they find that initially when they find themselves on the plateau, if you like, they're there. They're sort of they're, they've they've glimpsed the narrows of of the Dardanelles. If you if you know your Gallipoli expressions, they've got to the top and they're looking over the other side. 
but there wasn't enough of them. There wasn't enough troops with them to to carry the battle forward, which was that pivot point of the battle. If you you know many many battles that you you read about, don't you? How about you know, it once swung one way or the other, just on the point of a pivot? Well, that was it. Hill seventy, but it's at about ten eleven o'clock in the morning on the twenty fifth. Men from the London Regiment and the uh, Scottish Division get to the Hill seventy, but there's not enough of them, and their artillery fire terrible trinity is not able to be redirected sufficiently quickly and and in the right place um to to the point that they can't get any further and that's when the hakins reserve corps was needed but it hadn't been released and it hadn't arrived and it doesn't arrive for another 24 hours despite the fact it was only four miles behind the front line but that's your what if moment that had you know, the counterfactual, if the 11 Corps had got to Hill 70 at lunchtime on the 25th of September, they'd have broken through. Discuss. So back to back to our man, uh, Kipling. He came through here. Um, but there are accounts now uh, that have been found um, that say they, they a, a soldier finds a officer with a horrific facial wound um, he, he's very nearly dead and it's in Chalk Pit Wood and he carries the officer back to uh, the friendly side of Chalk Pit Wood just on the edge there which I've marked the southwest corner and uh, he lays him in a shell hole and leaves him and that's the last um, account of, of what, who this possibly uh, is was and uh, of course after after the war I can't remember who it is is it um so our friends um, from the WFA, I, my names have escaped me, but it's them that initiates a, um, uh, a project, if you like, to find um, whether Kipling is in fact buried. And their efforts um, have exposed that uh, a couple of the graves registration forms had the wrong grave reference on. And so that uh, they, they identified a unknown headstone in St. Mary's, advanced dressing station cemetery as possibly that of Kipling enough to the satisfa satisfaction of the Wargraves Commission and that is in fact what they've done they've renamed this uh, unknown uh, guards uh, second lieutenant to be uh, Kipling and he's buried on this side of the cemetery just over here now um, so in my knowledge I think his name is still on the memorial at uh, Lewes may be corrected on that and um, that was just what someone asked me the other day. But uh, yeah, so they think they had the wrong grave reference, uh, sorry, wrong a field burial reference for him. And that was the in the wrong place. And had that been corrected, um, then that would have been exactly the right place. And it, although it said it's a, a second lieutenant, he had actually been uh, promoted in the field, although it wasn't it hadn't been gazetted. And the body that they had found was uh, was of a was of a lieutenant. Um, who uh, and it's suppo supposed that Kipling would have changed his um, his his shoulder tabs to be uh, a subaltern a lieutenant rather than a second lieutenant. So uh, I think the jury's out for me, um, but most people seem to be satisfied. I'm just a bit more of a skeptic, I guess. Um, so that's where he is, is reportedly buried now in St Mary's ADS. Lovely view of that. And of course, I have one last uh, casualty, which I must mention, which brings me close to this battlefield, is Eric Boiling. That's my mum's uncle. And he is also buried uh, out on that battlefield, but he's still out there. Um, as you see, he's got his medal index card there. He's in the East Kents. Um, he arrived in France on the 31st of August. Didn't see any action until the 26th of September. He's one of them that arrived uh, having walked 25 miles in the pouring rain no hot food thrown straight into the melee that is the battle of Luz without ever seeing the ground probably never fired a shot bless him and uh, as it remarks on their death presumed 26th of September 1915 and um, he's he's out there somewhere in in that field of corpses um, that's that's the supposition from the war diary and uh, where they got to their high point and his name's Eric Boiling and so on the bottom of the screen there you can see Boiling E he's in the 8th East Kent's 72 Brigade 24th Division 
um, and there's Dud Corner Cemetery at the top. So for for me, it's a sort of bit of sweet story to tell. Um, a lot of us battlefield guides, and you know many of I know many of you know Clive Harris very well. We spend much of our time trying to champion um you know army generals as to doing the best job they could um at the time there wasn't anyone better and and they actually did quite well and we we hate that lines led by donkeys things but i find myself struggling a little bit with my own family's death here and, and the manner of of the deployment of the reserves um at uh, the battle of Luz. Uh, there are lots of other learning points that come out of it apart from apart from that one um we learn we not, must have better artillery we must uh, liaise with our artillery must have more guns more ammunition better time for staff work that's a big thing um you know a lot more work a lot more time is needed for staff officers to train you can't just turn them out overnight you know these these, these are men that need to go through lots of courses and lots of opportunity to train and yes one of the lessons for sure is we must handle our reserves more uh, closely and more more attention paid to them i think i'm done and i will stop sharing my screen and hopefully you're all still there indeed thanks very much indeed julian that that was tremendous um, okay good ladies and gentlemen um, in the time on the fashion if we can just uh, uh, raise our hands as a thank you, as a virtual round of applause in this instance. We can't hear it, Jules, but, but please take it from me that we've got hundreds of hands going up virtually on, on the Zoom, on the Zoom uh, application here, which is uh, the equivalent of a round of applause. So it's Q&A time now, folks. Um, so uh, whilst people are typing in the, the questions, uh, Julian, I'll just uh, quickly name check Graham Parker and Jill Legg as the, as the people. That Thank you. Were, yeah, Graham Parker. Yeah. As you were trying to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. recall there. That's okay. it. And um, just uh, one other thing uh, for, for you, uh, Jules, which is, um, I don't know if you can see that on the screen, that's the uh, pension record card for uh, your um, relative uh, showing, showing his pension. I hadn't the, looked that up yet. Is that off the recent um, release stuff? Not the most recent release, because the re most recent release is the soldiers who survived. This this is the release that's been around for about a year now. But this yeah. is, uh, he had a brother, William. So what we can see here is uh, the, the two brothers boiling, Eric and William, one in these camps, one in the Royal Barks, the dependent um, mother uh, who claimed the pension, uh, uh, Eric missing on the 26th of September uh, 15 and uh, William died of wounds on the 19th of April 18 and the benefit of these pension record cards is that unless you're actually familiar with the family you don't know if there's a relative who was killed uh, from the CWGC records but with these pension record cards um, if there is a brother you'll th th they will tie the, t tie the two or three or of many siblings up on the same pension record so anyway that's that's just that i must uh thank you for that david and i'll talk to you about that offline because you've just told me about an uncle i didn't know wow here we go so that's uh, we, we do occasionally get this uh, when uh, the, the, the guy that dies in 1918 yeah i've never yeah. heard of him yeah well well the, the benefit of these cards is that i have uh, in the past had a uh, feedback from somebody who, who on one of the pension cards it listed um, an illegit illegitimate child and, and, and the person came back saying, wow, it's a family I never knew about. So once again, we, we, we get well, to them. We, 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 we do learn stuff from these pension record cards. So uh, anyway, enough, enough of that. Hopefully we've got a few questions coming in now. So apologies for the slight digression there. I do apologise, everybody. Um, let's have Chris John Mark Smith up. Hi, Julian. Chris from the Guild and the Western Front. First Good man. Excellent talk. Thank you Cheers. so much. That was Cheers. brilliant, brilliantly illustrated. Thank you, mate. Uh, j j just a point as much as uh, a query. The release of gas, the author Henry Williamson wrote a whole load of books, The Chronicles of Ancient Sunlight, four or mm. five dealing with the First World War and the Battle of Luz. He, they're, they're, they're not fact. I think they're semi-fiction. I think mm -hmm. he's probably taken all sorts of stories he's heard and wove them in but 
as a, sub, a young subaltern, he joins a gas company for the release and with 30 minutes to go, discovers to his horror they've been issued with the wrong spanners to uh, turn the <laughs> cylinders on. And he has to rush up and down the line trying to find an adjustable one. I wondered if you'd heard of any difficulties like that. Uh, yeah, to... yeah, 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 you're, you're right, yeah. yeah. Go on, sorry, is there an, it, another point? It was the point? first time, you know, they've tried this stuff out, the typical of the army, to give the wrong, the wrong spanner out at the time. But you, you succinctly described the difficulties to the north of the field with this. Did you reckon the release of gas was a help or was it a waste of time, really? Or uh, what's your feeling? Well, I, I think overall, I think overall, most of them said it was a, it was a waste of time um, mm. um, and, and actually caused as many problems for the British troops as it did for the Germans. Mm. Um, and I, I, I wonder whether it was a it was a weapon that had been um you know rushed into action yeah, okay, uh yeah, because yeah. we must retaliate we must show that we can do this that the germans have done it to us um you know it it seems that the accounts are written up to suggest that um we were that short of artillery that we've got to use it uh we were certainly short of artillery and uh, and we weren't we were going to be short of artillery even on the first of july that on the song weren't we but um yeah. per perhaps um the the gas really wasn't ready to be used and and as you say spanners and things like that i mean here we are we can draw modern you know um comparisons to this covid malarkey you know you rush anything through and there's always going to be these hiccups like you like you said the wrong size spanner um i know that they they issued um gas grenades for Festiber as far as back as May of 1915 mm. and um, by the time they got to the front line ready to be used so many of them were leaking that they were that, you know they, they they didn't ever use them because they they were basically rubbish they said we can't use these they're more lethal to our own guys um, it's a horrible horrible bit of kit though um, yeah, um, and I know by the end of the war, we're really using it en masse and, and it's causing, I think it's um, one in 10 shells is is, is gas mm. fired. Um, but yeah, I, I, I completely get that, um, Chris, that it was, it was new, it was too new and there was bound to be some problems. Mm. I mean, the method of delivery is, is completely dependent on uh, the chief flatulence officer saying, yes, we can yeah. use it. <laughs> Th thanks, Great Chris. Thank you. Chris thank you. Super. Yeah, thank you. I'll, uh, just as a follow-up for anybody who's interested, we did have a talk by Gary Sheffield when he was asking the question whether gas was an underrated or overrated weapon. That is on YouTube, so if, if folk want to go to YouTube to, to look up a bit more about the use of gas, pl please please do so. Um, right, next up, Mark Smith. Mark, you're unmuted. Uh, fire away. Hello, Julian. Hi, Mark. That was fantastic. An amazing chap, really was. And uh, just like to touch on the gas thing there, because I did a full military career, 36 years. Even now, on modern operations, gas is still a poor weapon to get a level of concentration down. Even in the modern day, in the methods we have, it's still pretty rubbish. Yeah. So the good old fashioned high explosion, much, much better weapon. Anyway, yeah. That's, that wasn't my question. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that the um, British generals. We're not keen to fight a battle in the area of Luz. How much pressure was applied by, by the government to bite the bullet and support the French in the offensive? I, I, I think uh, your man Kitchener is the man that has to deliver that pressure. Um, wh whether, they deliver, whether they deliver it pol politically through... Uh, um, at, at number 10 when Sir John French is visiting back in the war office. I don't, I don't know, but certainly militarily, they use the conduit of Kitchener to say to them, you, you must fight here to, to assist our allies. And, mm -hmm. I, and I guess they're put in that position that the, the job of the army is, is a political one at, at, at best. And so they are there at their bidding, mm -hmm. you know, um, that expression on unfavorable ground, um, the alternative they offer at Mezines hardly seems that much more enticing to me. Um, and of course, we know about battles that take place there later. I, I, I don't, I don't know if I can offer any more than that politically. 
No, okay. Um, it's, it's just interesting. We have General Dannon, you know, in the, the operations we did recently. I wonder yeah. how spoken guy he was, but he got yeah. some fantastic kit by being outspoken. The only thing he got overlooked for, like chief of defense staff and stuff like that, by being outspoken. It's easy to, with, with being a politician and being a general, it's very hard to, to say no, isn't it, to the government? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and of course, um, look at what happens to Sir John French after. I mean, I ran out of time, but, you know, that's it. He's binned after yeah. this battle. <laughs> you know, he's had the failures of Neuve Chapelle, Festibur, Obers Ridge, and then Luce. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, with the debacle of Haken's Corps and the reserves, and, and Luce doesn't work, the gas doesn't work, there's too much pressure on him. And so he's relieved, but at the same time, he's offered home command and a Viscountcy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. You know, uh, I don't know if Richard Dannett got that. Oh, no, he, I, I still be in contact with him, actually. He's just a, a very, very interesting guy. But, uh, oh, I bet. I, uh, yeah. we're, we're First World War, I won't touch on modern yeah. sort of politics and government. Thank you very much indeed, anyway. Thank you for answering that question as well. Thanks, Thanks, Mark. Mark. Thanks very much. Uh, Annette, do you want to know where uh, unmute yourself there? Hello, yes. Brilliant talk. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I'm very Thanks, much amateur. Amateur in all of this, oh, uh, all. although I've been a W. Oh well, I'm really an amateur. I've been a WFA member for about 25 years because I wanted to act. Um, I wanted to access trench maps uh, because four of my close relatives were killed in First World War, including my grandfather, two of his brothers, and uh, a nephew. Um, and so I've traced their histories, walked the ground, but my great uncle Percy Stewart was a regular soldier. He was a sergeant in the third degree guards and killed at Lewis with no known greys. Um, do you have any any thoughts or information? He was called on the 27th of uh, September. Any the thoughts? Guards. On, yes, third degree guards mm. on what they were actually doing in, in all of this. Well, uh, and some. I mean, else... I know it was Guards Division, but uh... yeah, and and I think the Dragoon Guards. So they I don't even know. I'm going to have to. This is where I can hide behind being an amateur as well. And so I don't even know specifically what they were doing, whether they were dismounted troops or not by that stage, because sometimes the cavalry, even then, are still mounted, <laughs> ready to exploit, because this is what they were going to do: is going to go five miles in. <laughs> capture those crossings and then push on towards Mons mm -hmm. and the, the uh, one of the cavalry divisions I can't, is it third or sixth division cavalry division is attached um, so uh, I don't know um, but on the 27th of September that is when the guards move up that's when Kipling's killed and mm -hmm. so it, it it would have been likely that he's killed on that move between uh, somewhere between Bully Lemine and Hill 70 and that's probably about seven miles and I, unless I knew a little bit more about that particular unit, I, I shouldn't say anything else because I may be leading you the wrong direction. Okay. But by all means, you know, fire off an email to me and I'll see if I can find something more for you. Um, no, the war diaries are a bit scant on that day, so it doesn't really yeah. give you very much at all, really, because I think the keepers of the diaries were killed in succession at some point. So Quite likely quite likely yeah so you've just got him on he's at, he's at dud corner is he on the yeah. memorial he is yeah 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 i'm okay. sorry i can't offer anything tonight no that's fine that's fine good I'll luck okay thank I'll you ask you a question i met um stephen reese stephen just want to mute yourself there yep there we go great Julian, Hi, Stephen. what good evening wonderful talk i love the the illustrative maps as well so as as another sort of amateur, they, it just makes so much more to me, and especially having not been there, but driven through it on the on that A26 many times. Yeah. Um, another question related to gas. Um, if with gas being developed um, by the BEF, um, was in tandem with that, was there a development then in the development of British gas masks for the BEF? And if so, were gas masks used in the training of the 47th Division, which you gave your talk on tonight? Because I noticed in the in the um, the picture that you used, yes, they had their cloth caps on, but I couldn't see any gas masks. Perhaps that was artistic license. 
I yeah, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Good. Great question. And it allows me to talk about the gas mask. Yeah. So by uh, September, they had uh, that that awful thing. And I've actually got one upstairs and I should have put it on halfway through the talk for you. <laughs> but it's that awful thing that's like a cloth helmet mm. that completely covers you and has got a little plastic um, slit. And it's got the fluttering valve at right. the front. And the idea was that you then you then tucked in the fabric into your jacket and it provided just that few minutes of, yeah. of protection. Um, so, yeah, we developed that. And, and that's that's a great question. So, yes, that photograph or the sketch of them all throwing those grenades with their flat caps on is incorrect in that they, they all would have had that on. But many of the memoirs that you read say that within the first few hundred yards or so they have to take them off they they roll them up because they cannot get their breath and they say they would rather take the chance of a whiff of gas than than than, than stay where they are and and, and not be able to support their mates getting across the battlefield and that's what it's always about is about how they support their mates and i can't remember which one it was now but there is a great memoir of one of them rolling it up and lighting a fag (laughs) because 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 he needed a breath and uh, so he lights a cigarette to, to help him get on his way um but yes because with, with with the secret you were mentioning about the secrecy of of using of the cylinders and the, the, they were all given the rank corporal and they referred to chlorine as rats um yeah. you think well they must have twigged that you know the, the, the that something different was going to happen and they would have to the high command would have to afford them some form of protection yeah yeah. prior to the attack yeah that's right so they would have had those dished out uh probably by august so um and, and then in the last few days possibly possibly even within the last few hours there some of them wouldn't have known about the the the, the, the gas um yeah so because you, you know if, if you take you know uh like 90 hundred thousand soldiers and tell them something if one of them gets captured in a patrol German, you know, German recce that we can, the, the, the secrets it, yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Understand. Good question. Thank though. Thanks, Brian. Stephen. Thank, no, thank you very much indeed. Hugely enjoyable. Thank you. Good. Thank Cheers. You. Richard, Richard, Bill, you want to just unmute yourself there? Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, a, a great talk this evening. Uh, Cheers, really appreciate that. So uh, my relative, Alfred Bale, uh, was in the first 24th London and uh, fought in the battle and uh, ended up, unfortunately, in Quarry Cemetery at Vermel, um, yep. a couple of rows away from uh, Fergus Bowes Lions. Gotcha, yep. Um, but my question is, um, I'm trying to find anything about uh, what the first 24th did during the battle. I suspect they weren't in the first wave of the Londoners because that seems to be very well documented. Yep. But um, do you happen to know whether they're in the second or maybe in third wave? Um, of the Londoners' attack, they uh, they're not. No, they're, they're, there's. I think they are together with the twenty first Londons. I think they are on the right flank against the French, and the, certainly a, they are one of the battalions that launch what they call is the Chinese attack. So they don't actually get out of their trenches, and their job is to make a lot of fuss so that they attract the fire of the Germans and then they pour down a lot of fire but don't move forward. So they show their bayonets, make a lot of noise and then just shoot. Because at some point in in the whole battle frontage, there has to come a point where blokes don't go forward. You know, you've only got so many men, so many frontages. And so they are the troops that are literally on the on the left of the french and on our on the extreme right and i'm pretty certain that the 21st and 24th battalions are in there but again um if you drop a line through david through the wfa I, i've got their uh, divisional i've got the divisional history i can look that up for you in a couple of minutes uh, tomorrow or something and i'll i'll see what i can find about them that's great thank you so much and that's a lovely... Have you been to Quarry Cemetery? I have, yes. Oh, isn't it um, lovely? It's one of the best on the Western Front. Yeah, it is, amazing. It, it's set down, so you Indeed. can't really see it from the main road. And you go yeah. down the little track, and then it's just set down. And it's beautifully kept. And it looks straight towards the Hollenzollen Redoubt, which yeah. is where, uh, unfortunately, Alfred uh, 
was in a sap and shoved his head up and a shell, you know, uh, exploded very close to him and, uh, and took his head off. But we yeah, actually like, have the letter from his platoon commander in the family um, right. describing exactly what happened to him, which I guess, again, is quite unusual that yeah, uh, yeah. A, the, the letter was written and uh, survived, survived through the generations. Oh, lovely. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Thanks, for Richard. Glenn, um, I, I, we're going to have to have this as the last question, I'm afraid, folks, uh, because we are a bit over time, but uh, Glenn, fire away. Okay, thanks, David. Uh, first of all, Julian, thanks for an excellent presentation. You've illuminated me more on the Battle of Luce, of which I know very little about, apart from the 46th Division's attack on the Hohenzollern Redoubt. My question is actually about the reserves, and I'm aware there's a huge controversy um, between Haig and French and the use of the reserves and, and so on. But this, this was an army operation with First Army, with Haig in command of First Army. So I would have expected those reserves to be placed directly under his command. Um, whereas it appears that um, Sir John French at least had what we would call a string on those reserves. Um, was there anything in field service regulations or to do with um, the deference of the Edwardian army at the time, which meant that, that French kept a string on those reserves because with supposedly such an important operation to support the French army, one would have expected those reserves to be used to support First Army, and therefore Hay should have been given command from the start. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you, um, but I, you know, I'm looking at it obviously 100 years on in hindsight with a load of books and computers. But I, I would agree with you. But I think uh, before the battle, Haig would have agreed with you. I think <laughs> Haking would have agreed with you, and um, and the commanders of the French army agreed with you because they said so because uh, they both swapped plans so that they could see what the other was going to do and when they saw that Sir John French was keeping tabs on on his guys in 11 Corps they sort of said well they should be closer to the front and they should be under command of the guy that's going to know when they're going to be needed I, I, I really don't know anything about the Edwardian sort of period before this that may have um, had regulations about why it is. But one thing's for certain, analogies have been drawn between Hitler keeping control of the panzers on Normandy D-Day when Rommel and Guderian said that they needed to be close to the beaches of Normandy, not 20 miles inland under the command of Hitler who was asleep. Uh, but the, the, maybe I um, shouldn't draw an analogy between Hitler and Sir John French, because that's probably really a bit out of order. But militarily, he was keeping control, wasn't he? And um, there's part of me that maybe suggests a bit of vanity. Um, you know, he, he knew best and he didn't want Haig to take that decision. Um, could be one of the reasons that he was doing it, that he wanted to keep his control. I think he'd let go. He'd let go because Haig was going to run the show, really, once he'd told him he was to do it. And by keeping control of Haig in an 11 Corps, maybe that was that maybe that was way of um, of Sir John French sort of controlling a part of the battle and keeping his hand in. But th this is just me um, talking out loud with you, Glyn, a hundred odd years later. Um, I think your guess is as good as mine as to why he did it. But it, it's certainly... A, a, retrospect um it, it, it affected the battle badly um as far as outcome okay thanks thanks, thanks Glenn. Glenn. i can see you're, you're agreeing that french should have, should have been sacked yes i think so thanks Glenn. thanks for your question there right ladies and gentlemen that that i'm afraid is is it for uh, for, for tonight um if we'd like to, uh, once again, thanks Julian via the virtual round of applause, the, the old hand, hand raising routine on uh, um, on Zoom. Um, I can confirm that we've got uh, again hundreds of hands going up as a virtual virtual round of applause. Uh, th that's it for tonight. All I'm going to do is one quick advert for next Monday, which is Rob Thompson, who will be talking on. Wait for it. Lemons, chewing gum, whale oil and rivets. Everything you wanted to know about the Army Service Corps on the Western Front that were too afraid to ask. 
and I couldn't get through that without drawing breath. So one of these <laughs> days, we'll, one of these days, we'll, we'll have a we'll have a short short title from Rob, but not for the moment. But that'll be an entertaining <laughs> talk next Monday. Please do register for it and come along. Julian, that was a splendid, splendid Thank presentation you. about the uh, about, about the Battle of Loos, Loss, how we want to pronounce it. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, we'll no problem. Chat, lovely. We'll, we'll chat later about uh, about your wife's uncle. Uh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, um, thanks very much. Stay safe. See you next week. Good night. Mademoiselle from Armentier's Parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from